Okay, everybody, uh, welcome. Today, uh, I want to discuss something I, I have a deep, a deep love for, and that's not only video games, but the Resident Evil franchise, to be specific. I've been playing these games since I was little. I had Resident Evil 4 on, oh, heavy here. I had Resident Evil 4 on the GameCube along with Resident Evil 2, and I grew up with these games. They molded me to kind of be the, the video game player I am, and I wanted to show that and get sort of a retrospective, but something a little different. Normally, these kind of things go on, and, you know, they go through game one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever, and they talk about the more, whatever. I want to look at the remakes, but not just as games themselves, but as remakes. Do these remakes properly remake these games that I love so much, that you love so much? Or do they shamelessly rip them off for an easy buck, for cash money, and all that kind of shit? So we're going to be here today. I hope you join me as we look at the first of the three remakes. We have one for the GameCube and two for the PS4, Xbox One, and PC, and Switch, and a few other things. But that doesn't matter. We have one for the GameCube that we want to look at first, and that is Resident Evil Remake in 2002. So join me. Let's talk about this. So, before we jump head first into the titled Resident Evil Remake, uh, we should talk about the game that is remaking, Resident Evil for the PS1. This game was pretty big when it came out, really jump-starting the whole survival horror genre with games such as Silent Hill, Fast on its heels. Releasing in March of 1996, Resident Evil received critical acclaim for the first time. Could have been considered the best horror game around, which is really funny looking back at it because look at this game, it is laughable. The lighting is so bright, the voice acting, oh god, the voice acting. Hurry! Jill, what's going on? Any clues? No, but something's wrong with this house. Whoa, this hall is dangerous. But we're not here to talk about that game. So I'll keep it short. After this game's release, Capcom was quick to start development on the sequel, Resident Evil 2, which we'll be discussing next time. A few years went by with the release of RE2 in 1998, RE3 Nemesis in 1999, Code Veronica in 2000, and a few other spin-off games that don't really deserve much mentioning. Oh well, besides Gaiden, because I think that game is hilarious. Anyways, after Code Veronica's release, the new next generation of consoles were underway, with 2001 coming to Nintendo's year of the GameCube. Capcom and Nintendo had discussions about the upcoming generation and were able to strike a deal to where Capcom would make three exclusive games for Nintendo's lovely GameCube that I adore oh so much. Those three games being Resident Evil Zero, a prequel to the original Resident Evil that does not deserve any recognition, Resident Evil 4, considered by many to be the magnum opus of the Resident Evil franchise, and Resident Evil Remake, an entire recreation of the original game with extremely overhauled graphics, rendering, voice acting, thank God, and even diff different puzzles and story elements. Though this was a remake of the original people loved so much, it was really coming together to be its own game. Now, one thing to point out with this remake is that will come to play much later in the other videos is that Resident Evil Remake was made in the same gameplay style of what it, modern Resident Evil was at the time, which is considered classic Resident Evil now. Static camera angles, tank controls, the whole nine yards was the norm back in 2002, meaning that that was going to be the gameplay of their spiffy new remake. Considering this game came out three years prior to Resident Evil 4, it is interesting to think well, what could have happened if it was released afterward. Would we have gotten the remake of the same gameplay and control of RE2 and RE3 remake, or would they have stuck with the tank controls and static camera angles that made the original trilogy so good? Some interesting food for thought. Besides this point, Resident Evil Remake launched for the GameCube in 2002 and was, and still is, considered to be the best Resident Evil game in what is now known as the classic formula for Resident Evil games. For many years, the Nintendo GameCube was the only console that would experience this snazzy game, until 2016 when Capcom gave us the Resident Evil Origins Collection for Xbox One and PS4, the version I'll be using for this video. This version is the original GameCube version, except with higher resolution, widescreen support, some new costumes, and the option to switch out of tank controls and into a more modern movement convention that takes all the difficulty out of the game and makes the changing camera angles a little difficult. I know I'm jumping the gun here just a tad bit, but this change, though nice in thought because so many people nowadays love to bitch and moan about the tank controls of the original that is not as bad as people say. <sighs> Sorry. Anyway. This change, though nice, completely breaks the game and allows the player to move in ways the AI never was intended to go up against, meaning that juking out enemies and squeezing past them becomes a complete joke. It also is the main reason that every, every time I play this game, I keep it in tank controls. I also usually keep the camera in 4x3 instead of full screen because I never cared for how the game looks in full screen. 
but decided to keep it full screen for the sake of having a video look nice. So you're welcome, I guess. But alright, there's our history le lesson for today. Now let's dive into Resident Evil Remake. Oh yeah. The game starts with us lurking into the Arkling Mountains with our main focus of the game, the STARS members, or more specifically, the Alpha Team of STARS. After sending a Bravo team to investigate the strange cannibalistic murders in the Arklay Mountains, which run on the outskirts of Raccoon City, Alpha Team quickly loses contact with them, and decided to go in after them to find out what went wrong. During their investigation, one of our unlucky members, Joseph, gets gruesomely eaten by these savage canine dogs that sort of come out of nowhere. Jail Valentine, baffled by what happened in front of her very eyes, is snapped back into reality by Chris Redfield, who leads her forward, away from the things. With the rest of the Alpha Team running for their lives, and Brad just kind of leaving them, thanks, dickhead. Our heroes find themselves in this strange mansion, but with Chris nowhere to be found. Or jail, depending on which scenario you play. Okay, let me just start there. Most Resident Evil games have two characters you can choose from the beginning of the game, and for later games, I'll be doing both scenarios. But for this game, I decided to just finish jail, and I got a decent amount of Chris Dunn just for reference, for reasons I'll go into later. So for story's sake, I'll try to mention both, even though they contradict each other, but I'll mainly, mainly be focusing on Jill's campaign. But anyways, with Chris gone missing, Jill and Barry go deeper into the mansion to see if they can find their missing friends, while their captain, Albert Wesker, stays behind the inv and investigates the entrance. Further in they go, and this is when Jill runs into a strange person, but, you know. After running back to Barry and having him finish the bitch off, Jill and Barry head back to the front of the mansion, with Wesker missing. After this strange discovery, Jill and Barry do what any smart person would do in a horror situation, and split up to see if they can find more clues. Scooby-Doo? Anyone? Anyway, so the game begins with you controlling Jill or Chris and looking around the mansion for clues on what could have happened. Story kind of gets spoon-fed to you by a little increments, but only if you happen to read the files and have your obvious plot twist glasses on. While going through and solving these strange puzzles, you find these notes lying around that talk about these people who are investigating this virus that seems to have broken out, known as the T-Virus. With Jill, you happen to run into Barry from time to time as you explore these areas, but he seems acting weird, talking to himself, or so he says, sort of leaving you behind at times, and just wandering off to God knows where, and just not seeming like his normal self. In Chris's side, you run into Rebecca Chambers, a 19-year-old medic from Bravo Team who after the stupid story that happens in Resident Evil Zero, happens to find herself trapped in the mansion along with the, with the Alpha team as well. Chris and Rebecca team up, much like Jill and Barry, to see if they can find their friends and find out what is happening around here. As Jill digs deeper, she runs into this strange, disgusting monster that seems almost invincible. Later, after reading some notes, you'll find out that her name is Lisa Trevor, daughter of George Trevor, who built this mansion for none other than Umbrella. Okay, a lot of explaining to do. Bear with me. Umbrella, a pharmaceutical company that is located and runs within Raccoon City. Uh, Umbrella is so big that they pretty much fund the whole entire city. While digging our noses around this mansion, we discover that Umbrella was behind the whole incident, trying to build a super mutant that is referred to as the Tyrant. George happened to be the poor sap they hired to build this mansion for them and to keep their bad doings unknown. And as soon as he was done, they killed him. And did crazy experiments to his wife Jessica and his daughter Lisa fucked up, I know, but it doesn't stop there. Lisa ends up enduring so many tests that she becomes this crazy, insanely strong monster, and with all, her all insane in the membrane and shit, she starts to rip the faces off the people who Umbrella has pretending that they are their, her mother, so that Lisa can one day find her real mom and return the faces to her. This shit is downright creepy, and I love it. Lisa appears randomly throughout the game, just in certain scripted rooms, and every time you hear those chains clanking down the hall, you are greeted with this horrifying chill down your spine. You know she can't be killed, and you know she will do anything in her path to get what she wants. Well, as you dig deeper, Jill and Barry have a battle with Lisa, and Jill pushes these stones out of the way, revealing the corpse of the long-dead Jessica Trevor. Lisa, grabbing her mother's skull, has no more reason to roam, and jumps down the long pit, hoping to finally put an end to not only her, but her mother's suffering as well. Damn. This then leads us to the final area of the game, the underground lab. Umbrella's underground lab, uh, to be on the nose about it, 
Not much digging later, and we find out Wesker on one of these films with a bunch of other scientists that could easily be presumed to be Umbrella agents. But not too much later, we run into the man once again to find out he was behind it all from the start. Oh my god, not a surprise at all. I know. I mean, not only have I played Code Veronica and Resident Evil 5 before I played this one, but the dude is wearing sunglasses at night. If that doesn't scream bad guy, then Jesus, I don't know what does. Anyways... Wesker reveals to us that he was working for Umbrella from the start, and along with that, had held Barry's family hostage to use him to make sure no STARS member made it out alive. Then he lured the STARS team here to fight against their creation, the Tyrant, and that after the Tyrant killed off all the STARS, he would blow up the place, destroying the zombies and taking this Tyrant virus, T-virus, get it, and go off to sell it. Use it, not really sure what the end goal is, but either way, Tyrant ain't happy about that. Wesker dies by the thing, leaving Jill or Chris to take down the thing. After he has been defeated, Jill and Barry make up and they make their escape. But not without one last rustle with the tyrant that managed to stay alive, but lives no longer because Brad returns and gives you a neat little rocket launcher to blow him into smithereens. Everyone escapes. Well, besides Rebecca and Jill's campaign and Barry and Chris's, and the mansion blows up to be never be seen again. So, story-wise, this game was pretty basic. Basic enough that if there were no sequels to it, that it'd be totally fine. Which was done on purpose in the original, and they kept that feeling within the remake. But now that we, not, now that we got the story out of the way, it's time to talk about the more interesting stuff. You know, talking about the really makes the remake a remake, and not just a re-release of the original. So let's get into that. Let's start with the obvious stuff. First of all, this game looks incredible. Especially when you look at the original. Resident Evil, the original for this matter, had this awful lighting that made most scenes of dread just vanish out of the sight. Now, I know a lot of this is due to technical limitations, but they are still there. Now, the remake just looks gorgeous. Perfect lighting, where it's dark and creepy, but you can actually see. This game also sounds great. Most of the music is just revamped versions of the original soundtrack to Resident Evil Original, and thankfully not the director's cut, which changed the soundtrack originally due to the conflict that arose with the quote-unquote composer, that was Maoru Samurugachi. Apologies for the terrible pronunciation. I sat here for five minutes just trying to say his name. and I, American slang. Gotta love it. Anyways, he admitted to having other people write his music and that he was not actually deaf. But that's a story for the original Resident Evil video, so we won't get into that. At the end of the day, Remake has good music. And to top it all off, the voice acting is extremely better, which can be a bit of an off-put if you really like to do what I do with the original and make fun of it to hell and gone. I mean, the original voice acting is easily some of the worst, if not the worst in the whole video game industry ever. But enough of that. What about the gameplay? Now, comparing this to its predecessor, it's, it's not that different down the road, solely because Resident Evil and the remake are both controlled with tank controls and static camera angles. Now, I mentioned this before, but you can play with the alter controls if you hate having fun, but this isn't what Capcom intended, and that option wasn't in the original GameCube launch version. The two biggest things that come in Remake is to change the game up quite a bit, well, besides the changed up puzzles to keep the veterans on their feet, is the sub-weapons and the crimson heads. One at a time. Let's start with the sub-weapons. In Remake, you can find these little weapons, such as knives, grenades, a taser, and I suppose you could call one of these small one-shot magnum things, but they don't work the same as, the, for the sake of the argument, I won't conclude them. These little weapons are great. When you get grabbed by an enemy and have one of those bad boys equipped, your character will just pull it out of their back pocket and BAM into their face it goes. My favorite is with the grenades because they just kind of stand there all sad and defeated until they inevitably blow up. These are great because they allow for a little extra cushion when traveling, but also add strategy and such because if you use them all up early game, then you have the enemies become tougher, you'll have nothing to save your ass from the nastier bites. The second, and probably the biggest addition to remake, are these Crimson Heads. When I found out about these things, my 13-year-old heart skipped so many beats, the mere idea of them terrified me. How it works is, if you kill a zombie, they aren't dead. Give them 10 to 15 minutes of time and their ass is right back up, stronger, faster, and out for a vengeance. These are Crimson Heads, and when I was younger, I despised them. Now that I'm older, uh, and better, I see as such a fun tactic. Do you kill these zombies and risk him coming back, or do you dodge him? Not only save bullets, but to save the headache that the Crimson Head. There is a way to avoid the Crimson Heads, however, which is burning the body after you killed them and before they turned. 
The issue is, is that Chris, you need to take up a slot for the kerosene, and as Jill, you need to take two whole slots for the kerosene and the lighter to ignite the kerosene. This is genius. Allowing players the decision of, do I backtrack and get the needed items, travel back to the zombie, burn him, then return my stuff to then continue? Or do I play the easy route and leave him and suffer the possible consequence that may arise later down the road? You can also avoid crimson heads by getting a headshot and popping their head off like a balloon. But the issue is that it isn't consistent. Which weapon, each weapon has a percentage that they might get a headshot, which is super satisfying when it happens, but a bitch when it doesn't. You can also kill them with flame rounds, which, if you have the spare like I did, is perfect and saves a shit ton of time. Crimson heads are damn near perfect, but as much as I love them in this game, I'm really glad they have been brought back. They work so well here because it is the only time we see them, and though I might like it if they come back in a spin-off game or such, it is really cool to have them relegated to just this game entirely. So yeah, that's my review of Resident Evil Remake, all besides the verdict. How does Resident Evil Remake compare to its predecessor? Well, it's it's better. Hands down, this game does everything that the original wanted to do, but couldn't do to the limit, limited hardware. It's very obvious that this remake was meant to be more of a replacement than coexists, which is fine for me, because the original has probably aged the worst out of the whole franchise. I mean, it is still a good time if you're really into the Resident Evil franchise, but besides that, or maybe interested in the series' roots, there isn't much reason to go back and play the original over the remake. And that is Resident Evil Remake for the GameCube and uh, our enhanced version for the PS4. Now, uh, as we can see, these games were really, this game was just, it's just an HD remake, you know, it's got some extra graph, it's some better graphics, it's got some extra content, you know, with uh, the crimson heads and the sub weapons and all that stuff, but overall it's just a better version of the game. It's the same thing really overall. And so this one was a bit easier to make. I, that's really all there is to it. But now for our next game. For our next game in the lineup. It's Resident Evil 2. For PS4, Xbox One, and uh, Steam. Now this game came out last year, 2019, back in January. Along with Kingdom Hearts 30. Two big games that were being anticipated for quite some years. This one has a lot of history behind it. Not only with the game development itself. But with myself as Clint, I was watching this one actively for years, waiting for a fan project, all that nonsense. And so, yeah, I was excited for this game. I hope you'll join me next time to find out more about Resident Evil 2 Remake for next-gen platforms. But uh, that's all for this video. I do hope you guys enjoyed. If you, if you did, let me know. Let me know what you enjoyed, what was enjoyable about it. If you didn't, please let me know. Let me know what I need to work on. Make sure I'm doing this properly. And, uh... After all is said and done, I'll see you next time for Resident Evil 2. I've been Jake Gilgan now. I'll see you guys next time. Have a terrific night.